Jesus died for you and myself. Jesus says in Luke 20, verse 17, the stone which the builders rejected, this became the chief cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will shatter him like dust. In the words of Paul, if anyone love not the Lord Jesus Christ, let him be damned. The Bible says, because of sin, Christ died for us. Jesus died for you and me and every one of us. The Bible says, for all have sinned and falling short of the glory of God. But the Bible says, the wages of sin it is death. But the gift of God is by faith to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Prophets were judgment preachers. And there came a time in history when there was no other message to give. You comforted the people of God, but you terrified the rejectors of God. It is more than evident that we live in a godless, Christian-hating, God-dishonoring, and Christ-rejecting culture that is under the judgment of God. The Bible says that in the last days men will be lovers of self, proud, arrogant, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, swollen with conceit, and haters of God. And we are seeing this hate in front of our very eyes. It's on TV, in the news, social media. You cannot escape it. And since they hate God, they will also hate those who proclaim the truth of God found only in the Bible. However, the hate towards us Christians should not stop us from preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can save those who are perishing. The very one who says that I am not ashamed of the gospel, he says to young Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 4, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound doctrine, but having itching ears they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and will wander off into myths as for you always be sober-minded endure suffering do the work of an evangelist fulfill your ministry it is no easy task to share the good news with people that will scream at you spit on you assault you and may even kill you i want to tell you today in spite of all of that to not be ashamed of the gospel of jesus christ and to not fear the suffering that will ensue for proclaiming his name and the word of God. Again, the temptation for us is to be popular, but the mandate for us is to be unpopular, is to offend and terrify the ungodly. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. <laughs> Set it up. God bless you. Jesus came to save sinners, so Jesus can save you, sir. I forgive you, my friend. I want you to be saved, and I want you to know that Jesus took the wrath of God. Jesus was hit by the fire on the cross. And he came back from the dead to save sinners, sir! They don't necessarily hate you because of your personality or your tone or what you look like. They hate you because they hate the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said to the disciples in John chapter 15, If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, because I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Do not be ashamed of the gospel. We cannot have clarity in the gospel if we are ashamed of the gospel. Another reason why the world hates Christians is because we tell them that their deeds are evil. We confront their conscience with the gospel. We ask them to examine their life against eternity. We shed the light of God's truth on their heart and their conscience condemns them because they are not right with God. So instead of submitting to the truth, instead of surrendering their life to Jesus Christ, they suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about God is evident within them for God made it evident to them according to Romans chapter 1 verse 18. For even though they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish heart was darkened. Instead of bowing down to God, they turned away from Him and worshiped the creature rather than the Creator. The Bible says Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed with fire. Jesus said, Our generation is an evil generation, a dangerous generation. Fear God, every one of you. And obey his commandments. They celebrate their sin and publicize their immorality on billboards. It is as if the world, in its anger towards God, in its hate towards scripture, decides to build a new Tower of Babel, a tower that will stand against God and his word and his servants. We have to speak with boldness, 
with directness to a lying culture, lying leaders, lying people, immoral people, people who have gone too far. They have to hear it's too late for this nation. It is too late for this nation. In their mind, they think they can really fight God and even throw God off his throne. That is the mind of the lost sinner bound in his sin. The world in his darkness hates everything that is from the light because the light exposes the deeds of the dark. We are already in Romans 1. Judgment looms. Those who reject Christ will be crushed by him. He will return. He will return in judgment. We believers speak the truth in the midst of a perverse generation. Our society wants to do everything that they possibly can in order to live however they want to live. No restraint, no moral compass. They strangle their conscience each waking day and say in their heart that there is no righteousness, there is no morality, there is no judgment, there is no male or female, marriage is pointless, purity is nonsensical, there is no God. So when Christians come along and simply preach the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and tell the world if you live a certain lifestyle as an unrepentant cross-rejecting person you will die and go to hell. You must put your trust in Jesus Christ, repent of your sin and turn away from them so that you may have life. They find that message as the most hateful, unloving and offensive message. Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation. It's one thing not to be ashamed of the gospel, but it's another thing to actually have confidence in the gospel. And when I say have confidence in the gospel, what I mean is have confidence in the fact that the God uses the gospel to save sinners, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation, that the gospel is sufficient, that our work in the gospel will bear fruit, that our work in the gospel is our highest calling that we have confidence in the gospel we are all falling short of the glory of god the bible says all have sin and the wages of sin it is death but the gift of God is by faith through Jesus Christ. But why do they find that unloving? Why do they find that offensive and hateful? The Lord Jesus Christ said in John chapter 3, because they love darkness rather than the light, for their deeds are evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light so that his deeds will not be exposed. They hate the word of truth, despise the light, and certainly do not want to be governed by it. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1.18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Do we believe that the gospel is indeed the power of God? So since God and the Bible are the issue, then they war against it. Though that war may be in vain, they still do. They remove the Bibles from all public schools and in their effort to shut out the light, instead of Bible reading hour, they invite drag queens, which are homosexual men dressed as women, to come read drag stories to the kids in the schools. That is their strategy to win the war against God and the truth of scripture. They sanction, restrict, cancel the truth. They imprison those who proclaim it and execute those who live according to the truth of scripture. The darkness will do everything it can to snuff out the light. However, the kingdom of darkness will never win over the kingdom of light. The systems of the swell will never overpower the sovereign God of the universe. You may have preached the second coming of Christ, but did you preach it merely to comfort the godly and to get your eschatological chart together? Or did you preach it to terrify the unconverted? All liars will not enter the kingdom of God. The unrighteous will not enter the kingdom of God. Lavishness will not enter the kingdom of God. Lavishness will not enter the kingdom of God. Fornicators will not enter the kingdom of God. Sodomite will not enter the kingdom of God. Abusing yourself from mankind, you will not enter the kingdom of God. Homosexuality will not enter the kingdom of God. Abortion is a sin. You must repent and turn away from your wicked ways. Turn away from your sins and put your faith in the Lord Jesus. The time is now. The kingdom of God is at hand. Jesus Christ is returning again. I came to warn you in love that God's judgment is at hand. I am reminded of Psalm 14 where the psalmist says, The fool has said in his heart, There is no God. They are corrupt. They have committed detestable acts. There is no one who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of mankind to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. Together they are corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. Again, in 1 Corinthians 1, verses 20 to 25, Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? 
For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles, but to those who are being saved, Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Sinners are ignorant of the sovereignty of the God they reject, the power of the word they dismiss, and the dire consequences of being separated from the God of Scripture. Blinded by sin and influenced by the prince of the power of the air, the behavior is an accurate biblical description of what a sinner is a God hater. We don't hate you. We don't hate nobody. God is love. The Bible says the heart of men are desperately wicked and deceitful. The Bible says the heart of men are desperately wicked and deceitful. The Bible says, let the wicked forsake their wicked ways. Let the unrighteous change his thought and let him return to the Lord. The Lord is gracious and the Lord will pardon him. The Bible says, come, let us reason together. God is not far away from you. But the reason why we are separated from God is because of sin. Sin is the cause of the separation. The reason why you think there is no God, because you are corrupt. And the Bible says, the fool has said in his heart that there is no God. As the Bible prophesied and promises, all God-haters will fall under the judgment of God unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ and repent of their sin. These are the last days and it is unmistakable that the spirit of Antichrist is fully at play. And we can see what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3 being unraveled right before our very eyes. They curse God, deny the existence of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they want absolutely nothing to do with the Bible because the Bible is the inconvenient truth that stands in their way to live in complete immorality. Jesus Christ told us in scripture, though we are in the world, we are not of the world. We live in the world, but we do not partner with the world. The apostle John says, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them, because the systems of the world is of the domain of darkness, the kingdom of darkness, but we are of the domain of light, of the kingdom of light. And as such, we must call sinners to repentance. We must call them and drag them, as it were, from the kingdom of darkness, where people are perishing, bound in their sin, shackled and blinded by the power of the prince of the air. They are perishing. Those people, we are to preach the gospel to them and announce that the judgment of God is coming. The judgment of God is imminent and the judgment of God will not spare anyone who hates the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hates scripture and deny the existence of God. And Isaiah felt it and he even asked in chapter 6, how long do I preach to people who won't hear? And you said to him until there's no one left. Why? Because there is a holy seed, there is a stump, there is a remnant. Whoever you are, the gospel is enough to save you from the bondage of your sin. The gospel of Jesus Christ is enough to free you from the shackles with which you are bound. The gospel of Jesus Christ is enough and that is that gospel we are proclaiming to you today. Put your faith in the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, for it is in Him and Him alone where life is found, for it is in Him and Him alone where deliverance is found. Put your faith in Him and flee the judgment of God. What we do in the midst of this sin-sick age that has rejected the gospel and perverted the gospel and replaced the gospel with that which is not the gospel is that we call out that wickedness. We call it by name. And we remind people of the good news of the gospel again and again and again until it tastes sweet to them. When people say, no, our, our problem is this, our problem is that, we say, no, 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 our problem is that God created the world and God created man and he put man in the garden to keep the garden and he gave the man a command and he held that man to perfect, perpetual obedience to that command and he promised him life if he kept it and death if he didn't and he didn't keep it, he ate and because he ate, because of that one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And everyone born from that man through ordinary generation inherited that man's sin nature. And because of that sin nature, sins proceed from it. And our world is broken because of that sin. And we stand guilty before a holy and righteous God. And we know that he's holy and we know that he's righteous and we crave justice. 
But the problem is that if God gives us justice, we all die. And so that God in his goodness and in his mercy sent forth his son who was not born of ordinary generation but was born of a virgin yes the virgin birth matters why because if he's born of ordinary generation he's born in sin but because he's not born of ordinary generation he's not born in sin he's clean of sin his record is clean and he keeps his record clean and he obeys God's law and because he's fully God and fully man he obeys the law of God on our behalf in his active obedience. And then in his passive obedience, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. All we like sheep had gone astray. Each of us had turned to his own way, but God laid upon him the iniquity of us all. And Christ died for sin once for all, the just for the unjust. And God imputes our sinfulness to him. And he nails our sinfulness to the tree. And Christ dies and raises again on the third day for our justification. And there's another imputation. The righteousness of Christ is actually imputed to us. So that God can be both just and the justifier of the one who places faith in Jesus Christ. So that all those who come to Christ may enter in so that all those who place faith in Christ might be saved, but not only saved, but sanctified. Because he's the firstborn of many brethren. We're justified and we're adopted into the family of God. And we're sanctified. And as his children, we begin to bear the family resemblance. And we're further sanctified throughout this life by the very same gospel that saves us until one day when it's all said and done we're not just saved from the penalty of sin we're not just saved from the power of sin but one day we're glorified and saved from the very presence of sin that's the gospel that we preach that's the gospel that we need and that's the gospel that's more than enough